Okay, well, welcome back. We're here with Brad Efron, our colleague here at Stanford. Um, Trevor and I were students here from 1980 to 1984, roughly, and Brad was our, our professor. He was actually my principal supervisor. And Brad's been here since... I started as a student in 1960. 1960, and a professor here since 68, is that right? Well, I was, I was assistant professor in 65, or 4, and then worked my way up the ladder <laughs> to my present high position. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the, in the course, we talked about the bootstrap, which is a, a very important method in statistics, and Brad invented the bootstrap about a year before we got here, right, 1979. So you want to tell us a bit about how you came about... How the idea came? Right. Well, it's a story about having uh, good colleagues. Uh, uh, Rupert Miller, my advisor, uh, was a leader in trying to understand the jackknife, which was, was Tukey's adaptation of Kanui's brilliant idea. And, um, and Rupert had written a paper called The Trustworthy Jackknife. They were trying to understand when the jackknife worked. And uh, I went and uh, into David Cox's uh, department for a year at the same time as um, Rupert, 1972-73. And Rupert gave another good talk on it. And afterwards, David Cox came up to me and said, in his inimitable way, that might be a good thing to work on. And he didn't say it quite that way. He said it in a more elegant way. English restrained way, <laughs> but uh, it stuck in my mind. And uh, at that point, I was working on um, curvature and stuff like that. And I got back, and uh, I, I had written uh, one line down on a piece of paper, uh, which was, uh, what is the jackknife uh, an approximation to? And that uh, got me going on it. And. Um, how long did it take to write the paper? Hmm? How long did it take to write the article? Oh, a few months, and it didn't. And I must say, at the time, it did not seem like it was especially special paper. And, and what did the journal say? Would, would they uh, well, first of all, I gave it as the Reitz lecture. In um, uh, it was in Seattle, and uh, uh, the um, I, I got some nice comments and also some criticisms. Wolfowitz was there, and he stood up and said. Uh, 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 what uh, what theorems support this? And I, I, I said something uh, wise like, uh, well, I didn't want to ruin a perfect effort. Uh, <laughs> but, but when the paper came back, uh, Rupert was the editor of the Annals of Statistics, and the paper came back, it was sort of rejected, and the uh, associate editor, who was, it turned out to be John Hartigan, sort of raised the same uh, objections. Uh, Hartigan had we work uh, on um, uh, half sampling, which is quite similar, and, uh, and Tukey didn't like the bootstrap, and so there was some opposition. Uh, Tukey's uh, objections were aesthetic. He, he, said, he thought that it was uh, uh, clumsy compared to the jackknife, which it is. It's, it's a computer-based method, and uh, it doesn't have to be computer-based in theory, but in fact, there's no way to do it except in the, with the computer. Um, and um, I, I had to really work. I put a big, long uh, uh, appendix on the paper uh, that then uh, Rupert grudgingly, I must say, uh, accepted. And, then, and I'm, sure, I'm sure if I didn't have him next door to me as my former advisor, I don't think I could have had it published. And then, Which made me realize uh, subsequently, and I've been editors of things, is that um, papers that arouse a lot of opposition should be looked at carefully by editors. Most of them are junk. That's the reason they get it. But some of them, the opposition is because there's actually a new idea. And then, luckily for us, while we were graduate students, your little monograph came out, which was the jackknife, the bootstrap, and other resampling plan. Yeah. You can see from the title mm. that I was still thinking about the jackknife. Yeah. I think the idea was really far ahead of its time. I remember as a graduate student, uh, someone in physics asked you to give a talk on the bootstrap in physics. And you were busy, so he asked me to go to give a talk. Right? So I gave just a general talk about the bootstrap to the physicists. This is about 1983 or something. And the physicists, they, were, they basically, you know, I mean, they accepted it right away. Oh, yeah, of course, you're just doing simulation. Right? For them, the, the bootstrap was very natural. Whereas in our field, statistics, which really grew out of mathematics, it took a much longer time for the field to embrace the idea of using simulation to actually to make inferences. 
where in, in fields with, that needed computation earlier, by physics, yeah. it was a much more natural idea. Yeah, I found that too. And then for the next several years, and you know this because you worked with me on this, we worked on uh, trying to make the bootstrap work better than just be a plug-in uh, first or first order method. And for me, this was very important because I wanted to show that it, uh, it, it, it connected to statistical inference in a deeper way than just plus or minus something. Was that the first name you thought of, the bootstrap? Or were there other? Uh, the, uh, the end of the uh, bootstrap paper has a joke on it, which shows that I wasn't taking it very seriously. I was kidding Tukey. Tukey uh, had uh, said about the jackknife uh, that uh, it was a rough and ready tool good for any uh, purpose. Yeah. And I said at the end uh, that I thought of calling it the shotgun. Uh, which could blow the head off of any problem if he could stand the mess. <laughs> and uh, I don't think Tukey appreciated that either. Um, uh, Tukey asked me a couple times if we could write a paper together. And um, I vastly admire Tukey, and I would never write a paper with him. It's way too difficult. <laughs> now, 30 years have passed, so is, I mean, I guess. Uh, the field has changed. Is the bootstrap still important? And is it is, is are there problems to solve in the bootstrap that are that uh, modern okay. computation? Good, good question. Uh, or am I has been? Is that, a, <laughs> that's that's that way. can I rephrase it that way? Uh, so I didn't work. I, I've worked about ten years on the bootstrap and then quit because I didn't have any more ideas. And then in about ten years ago. I started working on more empirical Bayes stuff, which goes back to my early 1960s work with Carl Morris. And at this time, it was in the context that you and I worked together on, on uh, microarrays. And, and gradually, the bootstrap has reappeared in my work because it's, it's a convenient way to do certain kinds of Bayesian calculations. And moreover, not just to do them, but to understand why Bayesian calculations are really more closely related to frequentist work than is obvious. Um, um, Percy, uh, it was just David, uh, um, Dennis Lindley's 90th birthday, and various people, including myself, were asked to write little things about it. And Percy showed me what he wrote about how he took a lot of guff from the Bayesians for having helped me. Uh, we wrote together for Scientific American on the bootstrap, and he, they said, uh, Lindley said that the bootstrap was uh, just the most egregious of uh, frequentist nonsense. And, uh, and yet I think that it's quite closely related to uh, uh, Bayes' theory. And as a matter of fact, I'm trying to write a book now, which has started out really wonderfully, uh, called Computer Age Statistical Inference, available soon, <laughs> and, uh, 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 in which I will try and make the connections more between Bayesian and frequentist yeah. uh, inference, and the bootstrap is an important part of that. So you don't plan to retire soon? You don't plan to? Um, plan is a, <laughs> a strong word at age 75. <laughs> you, you must have seen big changes in data analysis. Over the yes, years. and that's, I've seen uh, over the, the, my career, which is mainly a lot of the applied work was at the medical school with you too. Mm -hmm. Um, and you too come think of it, is uh, the changes are phenomenal uh, from looking at, looking at 1964, a data set that fit on one page that was pretty much solved using versions of the t-test uh, 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 was pretty much it. And then you could, I could get Jerry Halpern to help me with the computer and do, do things, you know, one batch at a time. And now, and I'm no great chicks at the computer, but I can go 100 times faster than I used to. And I can do the new tools that are available, like Cox Proportional Hazard, or Generalized Linear Models, or GLMs, or whatever, uh, uh, which your book uh, uh, is really quite eloquent on, uh, are, are just wonderful. Those are all in the, what I would call, most of that's in the pre-inference stage, in the algorithmic stage. And it's, it's much harder, and the, the field has been much slower at, at, at doing the uh, inference part of that and saying how, for example, how well, what's, is there a lower limit on how well you can predict 
uh, upper limit and how well you can predict that we don't have something like the Cremere Rao lower mound. By the way, Brad is a pretty big shake on the computer. He writes his own R code. He's got his own library of R functions. <laughs> and whenever we, we work on a problem together, Brad always wants to program it up himself and see, see how it works. So he's a real hands-on person. Well, I think it's also true that you know, science has really changed our field. You told me at one point that you know, in, the, in the past, you used to sort of sit at, sit at your desk and try to think of things to work on. But then you start, started working in the medical school and doing... Uh, more applied problems, and they actually, the, the problems that arose there, they, they sort of informed you on what to work on, so that you, you couldn't believe in the past that you would actually sit there and just sort of make up problems. Now most of your work, is that right, comes from... Uh, I've gone a little bit report. back to the makeup problems, <laughs> 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 uh, mainly because I haven't uh, honestly kept up with the uh, microbiology uh, statistics work. Yeah. It's just gotten too much for me, for, uh, yeah, I can do an R code and stuff like that, with your help usually, uh, and uh, I, I can do this and that. But I'm not, I'm not, I just so envy people who are real naturals at the computer, and naturals in the sense of being able to work flexibly with the um, uh, theory and uh, not get overwhelmed by the details, which are, to me, just overwhelming. Well, I taught uh, Trevor most of his programming code. <laughs> um, Skills, so fortunately. Yeah, uh, Trevor is, is just remarkably good at that stuff. Oh, uh, thank you, Brief. <laughs> you, you, uh, <laughs> uh, we have some you, inside you wrote, jokes here. <laughs> you wrote uh, a, a large part of the software I use. Yeah. You didn't. <laughs> uh, well, Brad. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been wonderful working with you. Yeah. Um, the bootstrap yeah. is used everywhere in applied statistics. I think anybody who, who learns applied statistics ends up using the bootstrap one way or another. And so you've got a wonderful legacy. Yeah. Legacy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Thank you guys. Yeah.